on this episode of Pod Packa, I say thank you to the wonderful teachers that have retired. Special guest Greg Biba stops by to discuss his new book, and we discuss Wapaka's history of gangsters, all of which you won't want to miss. But first, there is a huge primary in Wapaka County a couple of weeks ago. There was, of course, the contested Republican primary for governor for the state of Wisconsin, which had huge implications, which Tim Michaels ended up winning. But in Wapaka County, there is also a huge Republican primary for the Wapaka County Sheriff's race. Incumbent Sheriff Tim Wills was reelected to be the sheriff. He won by a little over 1,500 votes. Durant won the towns of Dayton, Farmington, Iola, and Wapaka, but it was not enough because Wills ended up receiving most of the votes in the cities of New London, Clintonville, Wyoiga, and Manawa. Congrats to incumbent Sheriff Tim Wills, but also good job everybody in the Wapaka County because there are a lot of places in Wapaka County that were running out of ballots. There's a huge turnout for this primary vote, so good job for turning out and contributing by voting. Also, school is starting up soon. I wanted to welcome the new teachers on behalf of Podpaka to the Wapaka School District, so welcome the new teachers. If you see a new teacher, make sure to tell them welcome, but since there are new teachers, that means there are teachers that have retired. On behalf of Podpaka, I want to make sure that we give the special recognition that retired teachers deserve. So here we go. Marianne Snyder, an eighth grade English teacher at the Wapaka Middle School, 23 years. Congratulations. Lori Reitz, a special education teacher at the Wapaka High School, was there for 28 years. Congratulations on retirement. Charles Peters, an at-risk teacher at the Wapaka High School for 42 years. Congratulations. Laurel Leader, a choir teacher at the Wapaka Middle School for 20 years, has officially retired. Congrats to her. Mr. Mark Kreshak, an instrumental music teacher at the Wapaka High School for 37 years. He was also Wapaka City Band Director for the last 37 years. Congratulations to Mark Kreshak. Lisa Engel, an educational assistant at the Wapaka Middle School, 24 years at the Wapaka Middle School. Congratulations. Nancy Cummings, an English teacher at the Wapaka High School for 21 years. Congratulations to her. Lisa Anderson, a second grade teacher at the Wapaka Learning Center for 32 years. Congratulations to her. Congratulations to all of those retiring teachers. Again, welcome new teachers. And I hope school goes well for everyone since that's starting up soon. Now, before we talk to actually a retired teacher, Greg Biba, who retired a few years back, before we talk to him, this episode is presented by Northern Kitchen. Northern Kitchen is a brand new store that is in Lucky Tree's family of stores on Main Street in downtown Wapaka. This new kitchen store is on the corner in the last block on North Main Street. It looks fantastic in there. You have to see it to believe it. My mom, Michelle Drake, has been working really hard on this store. It looks great in there. There are lots of great kitchen gadgets that you cannot find anywhere else in the area. Make sure to shop at Northern Kitchen on Main Street in Wapaka. I'm here today once again alongside my dad, Tim Drake. How are you doing today, dad? I'm good, man. How are you? I'm doing good. I'm really excited for today's episode. We're going to be here with a very special guest who is another guest from the Pack area. And here's the crazy thing. He was a music teacher for 30 years. 
and then he retired and then he started a new career of becoming a local offer who has been just a huge hit in Opaca. I know everyone is loving his books and it's so awesome to have him here today. So everyone, please welcome Greg Biba. How you doing, man? Doing great, Tim. Thanks. How are you guys doing today? We're good. We're good. I appreciate your time. Sure. So you got your, uh, your third book, you got it done and illustrated and everything? Well, I have, um, I have a third book done but my third book in the adventure series is not quite done. I'm still waiting for my illustrator to finish it. Um, oh. if, if I have adventure one, which was Strand Lake mystery. Yeah. And then uh, adventure two was hunt for the black coral. And adventure three is death wish of Machu Picchu. And it's written, but I'm still waiting for my illustrator, which is amazing. I don't know if you've seen any of the illustrations in, in the uh, second hunt for the black coral series, but as you can see, she's just quite amazing. So being patient and waiting for her to finish her illustrations on Death Wish and Machu Picchu. Okay. Since then, I wrote an another one. It's called 900 Miles to Plenty Wood. It's an ancestry book. What's it based on? Well, it's a true story about my mom's great uncle in 1906, Tim, was appointed the first town cop in Plentywood, Montana. And the trials and tribulations of the family moving out there when he was 18 years old and the mayor then mayor bolster recognizing his talent and his ability ability to to stay calm and cool under pressure um and the mayor then appointed him as the first town cop in plainwood montana 1906 of course the railroad was booming and the immigrants were rowdy and cowboys coming in off the plains and so the they needed some more law enforcement out there for sure and he did a really nice job Till 1914 15 where he got shot in the streets by who his brother-in-law oh wow I mean, yeah they both were uh, a little bit inebriated a little drunk in the saloons that that night and uh they got in a bad quarrel got in a bar fight and ended up uh uh ben day who's my mom's great uncle got killed okay so that's 900 miles to plenty wood is this the first nonfiction you've written? Yes. Okay. Well, no, no I, I did write a first, a first one. My first one ever was this one, Band Instrument Quick Fix Repair Solutions Manual. That was oh, my, first, okay. my first gist at writing. And it, uh, when I got my master's degree uh, many years ago and GIA publishing out of Chicago, um, jumped all over it and, and uh, um, it's been selling worldwide actually i did some clinics years ago at some music conventions about uh, band instrument quick fix repair solutions and it's been going over very well that was my first my first book now i'm curious i know uh, a, a lot of your books are sold in the local gift shops in downtown wapaka mm -hmm. um i believe in almost well i wouldn't say all of them but quite a few of them yep uh where else you know if someone's outside of wapaka where, can, where else can they purchase your your material well, as a matter of fact, yesterday I shipped about 20 or 25 books over to Plentywood, Montana, to the Rexall Drugstore, where um, a lot of the history uh, took place. And uh, so the 900 Miles of Plentywood book is now in Plentywood, Montana, plus the local libraries like Iola, um, Watoma. There's some other uh, local cities that have them. Oh, and the Stratton Lake Mystery book is now in at the Scandi Hoos um, bookshop in Scandinavia. Okay. Um, and are uh, they available? Are they available online anywhere? Yes, they are through Amazon. Yeah, you can order okay. order on Amazon. I appreciate that offer. Um, of course, at your shops, Northern Home and and uh, Lucky Tree shops, and um, of course at the bookseller downtown, it's Aquamos Coffee Shop downtown, okay. and Off Outfitters. Yeah, I love the. I love the illustrations in your book. I know you're showing uh, some of the illustrations inside the book for uh, Hutford Black Coral, yep. but like this illustration here is amazing on the cover. Yeah. Like, and um, then there's this back too. Yeah. Like, wow. Really, really great. Um, a new artist, um, a friend, friend, a daughter of a friend, good friends of ours, Chris Amoran. Um, she lives down by Kenosha, I believe, right now. And uh, she's just amazing. Uh, and uh, worked with her on the artistry 
and uh, you can be more happy with it. Lots of compliments on her artistry. Corissa Moran is great. Well, I know it says uh, on uh, 900 Miles to Plentywood, uh, it's by Greg Biba and Ethel Biba. Who is oh. Ethel Biba? Ethel is my mom. Uh, actually, it was her great uncle that uh, is the subject of the book. So my mom kind of got me some information about it, and then we wrote, kind of co-wrote it together. Oh, that's awesome. That's wonderful. And back in the 1970s, we, uh, my mom's mom or my grandma was a little bit shy about the whole situation. So she took my mom aside in the back bedroom and said, hey, uh, Ethel, I want to talk to you about this situation that happened out in Plentywood years ago. And that's kind of how it got rolling. You must have been pretty surprised. Oh, very, very surprised. Yeah, Joe, very surprised on that. Um, but yeah, it's a good story. It's a... Uh, it's got uh, the history of the railroad, the honeymoon, uh, about homesteading, uh, him becoming the town cop, him getting murdered, there's a gunfight, there's lots of intrigue as well. I won't ask you a whole lot about that book because I don't want you to you know, spoil it for everybody. Right. But yeah, yeah, that sounds, it's amazing family, what, what, what family history can dig up. <laughs> oh, for sure. I'm sure everyone's got skeletons and everyone's got some good things, you know? Yeah, definitely. Are you a big uh, genealogy guy at all? Um, I'm not so much um, as my brother, Scott, and my mom. Um, I, but I'm, I'm following it more now, of course, with our Plentywood history. And actually, um, I'm writing another ancestry book with my brother, Scott, called The Towers. And in real life, back in 1597, my, my mom's like 11th generation great-grandmother was accused of being a witch in Germany, honestly in Nuremberg, Germany, I believe it is. And well, she hung herself in, in the witch's tower and she could not bribe her way out so she couldn't handle the pain and the, of the torture. So she hung herself. My gosh. And that was not unusual back then. What year was that? It was what 1597. Time? We're currently working on that together. It's called the tower. It'll be called the towers and, and uh, um, kind of incredible uh, well, you like you said before, Tim, your family can dig up a lot of skeletons. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's, you said there's always good and bad. Yep. My family in particular, I always found it odd that uh, it's like the good skipped a generation. <laughs> you'd have a whole bunch of rabble rousers. And like you, right? Back, no. yeah. <laughs> then you'd go back to like, you know, clergy and police officers and farmers again. Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Now, without getting into any spoilers, what can we expect from the death wish of Machu Picchu? And uh, is this going to be the final book in that series? Yeah, it'll be adventure number three, Joe, in, in the series, uh, Death Wish of Machu Picchu, does take uh, me and my family to the hills of Peru. And in real life, there's supposed to be some lost Incan treasure buried in the mountains of Peru. And I was writing about this and I ran into a friend of mine, Ian Johnson, uh, at a Rotary Club event years ago. And I said, what are you doing? I just got back from Peru. I was on exchange. No way. I'm writing a book about Peru. So we just started, started discussing it. And he and his family had just gotten back actually from Peru. Their family went on the hike. I'm actually, might, I might even go there in March and do it myself. Um, and I don't think I'll find any treasure, but you never know. Have you been to Peru before? I've never been to Peru, but my son and daughter were Rotary Exchange students in South America. And so they helped me out a little bit on the translations and, and history of South America and Chile, Chile, which my daughter was in and was in Paraguay. Chile was uh, close to Peru, so she gave me a little bit of history on the history of Peru. Uh, but yeah, I don't want to give too much away on the Death Wish of Machu Picchu one, but um, we do find some lost Incan treasure. And we do make it out alive, of course. Hey, did you know that you can advertise on Podpaca? Yes, you saw a advertisement for the new kitchen store, Northern Kitchen, earlier. But did you know that you, if you have a local business or product that you'd like to advertise, can have an advertisement read off by myself and maybe even myself and Tim Drake and it will appear on a Podpack episode and the best part is it will be there 
forever. Once it is on the podcast, it is accessible at any time, anywhere, on all platforms. So if you are interested in having an advertisement, let us know at podpaca at gmail.com. That is podpaca at gmail.com. And now back to talking with Greg Biba. Yeah, I was wondering, when did you, uh, how long, you weren't born in Wapaka. You, you moved here, didn't you? Yeah, I moved here. My wife Dawn was, grew up here um, near Stratton Lake, well, actually in, this, in the home that we currently own now. And okay. uh, I grew up in Janesville, Wisconsin, a uh, product of General Motors. Um, my yep. dad retired from there, and we, uh, I went to college over in Appleton, actually, Lawrence University, and uh, uh, studied there, of course. And my first job was at uh, Manitowoc Ron Colley High School for three years. And then I met my wife, Dawn, and then we moved down to Palm- or Janesville again, where I grew up, of course. And then I started working at Palmyra Middle School. Uh, Palmyra Eagle Middle School, and I was a band director there for three years. And then uh, we decided to have kids. Before actually, actually, before we had kids, we wanted to travel, and so we went on some visiting teacher exchange programs. And um, uh, then, uh, actually, right after the first Persian Gulf War, we decided to go abroad one more time. We had visited in visited. We were visiting teachers in England, um, and. Uh, uh, then we decided to travel one more time. We actually decided not to teach in the Middle East, but where did we go? The Middle East, <laughs> um, where, where both Dawn and I were accepted as uh, music. I was a band choir and general music teacher at, at uh, this uh, Bahrain Bayan school. Um, and uh, Dawn was a school counselor. We were there for roughly a year. And then uh, my dad had terminal cancer. So we came home. Where, where, uh, where at in the Middle East? There's, it's in a country called Bahrain, just east of Saudi Arabia oh, in the okay. Persian Gulf. You told me a story about that once. Didn't you have some, almost have some issues leaving there? Uh, yeah, um, actually, Mrs. Biba's, uh, um, Mrs. Biba's escape from Bahrain actually was happening um, at, at this point. I, I think I mentioned my dad had, was, had terminal cancer, and they oh. allowed me to leave for a while to see if he's okay and, you know, see if be with them. And then uh, we found out that Mrs. Bebo was pregnant. Oops. So we decided to um, get her out because uh, our friends who were, who had been teaching in Kuwait and American friends and so forth decided that we got to get you out done, but we can't tell them. Well, why not? Because they could, they, yeah. could, they could take your passport and let, not let you go in the airport. So they, they got her a ticket at, on a Sunday night at midnight and they got her out. And Dawn actually also um, met a uh, female doctor from India who forged some papers for her to get her out in case they asked how, how many months pregnant you are. Um, and uh, so I think she was several weeks, maybe even a month beyond where they want you to fly internationally. So she got some paperwork in case they asked and and she made it home. Wow. What would, have, would they have, if she would have been caught, would they have just, would they have kept her for the duration until she gave birth and let her leave or what? I don't, been? that's another good question, Tim. I, I don't know. That's probably, you know, um, no clue. And then of course, this is way before it's fax, fax machines and, or uh, cell phones rather. So we were faxing back and forth to our district administrator back there. And, uh, he accused us of uh, just leaving without telling them, which we basically we did, but um, they uh, said we owed them so much money. No, we didn't. We gave them our access to our credit, our bank account and all these other things. Uh, they had plenty of money. Well, they faxed us back again and said, fine, you're not gonna work in Bahrain again. It's all right. You, you were good with that? We we're fine with that, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and then I came back and decided to uh, start subbing in the Wapaka School District and Waiwiga and, and Watoma schools and got my foot in the door here in Wapaka as the first halftime band director. Okay. Then he started here in 1990. Almost sounds like the basis for another book, Greg. Well, actually 19, 1994. Yeah, actually I could. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> 1994. Real, real life can be pretty interesting. So. Oh, that's true. It's true. Actually, I'll leave that the storytelling to Mrs. Biba. She 
she's part of the Wapaka storytelling group and she's she's pretty good about telling these stories as well so i mean uh, you you retired from music and you were joe's band teacher as well thank you for that oh my pleasure oh yeah you were a great teacher yeah i i still remember uh the marching band they were going down the street and joe had his solo smoke on the water with his tuba (laughs) and uh i thought that that was pretty you were so excited too when he was done you were just uh well, you know, I appreciate all your support, you guys, over the years. And, and uh, you know, it's students like Joe that kept me going, really, really, really kept me going and, and enthused about it. I still am. Do you still, do you still play quite a bit? Oh, yeah. I play a lot, actually, uh, pretty much every night of the week. Now, this, now with COVID being done, uh, I give myself Tuesday night off. Like, uh, uh, tonight we have a, a, uh, I'm a member of the Kimberly City Band. We have a concert. Kimberly City Band, um, the Watoma, or excuse me, the uh, Wild Rose City Band, Wapaka City Band, um, and the, uh, what else, uh, the, uh, I'm a member of a saxophone quartet out of Appleton, Fox City Swing, big band, and River City's Jazz, big band. Okay. Do you play, uh, what's your primary instrument, the saxophone, or do you play multiple instruments? Oh, I play several, several, saxophone, clarinet, wherever they want me. Okay. What's your favorite? Probably sax. Okay. Did you have to learn uh, many instruments for when you became a band teacher? Since you oh, have to yeah. do a lot of them so you can oh, teach yeah. all the middle school. Exactly. Schools. Yeah, I did. I did. I did have to teach all the, learn all the instruments. So are you, are you, are you uh, enjoying your retirement from teaching music? I know oh, you stay busy, but... I'm, I'm still, yeah, I'm still teaching a little bit here and there privately and stuff like that, but uh, guest conducting in Wild Rose and and so forth, but yeah, I'm I'm definitely enjoying retirement. But it's a different kind of retirement now. I have, uh, of course, I'm writing books. I have a lawn and garden service, and uh, and my my band playing is keeps me definitely busy. Okay. Now, when you were younger, did you ever uh, play in a a rock band or anything like that, or punk no, rock? Band? No, was- I never did. I never did. I never had that really uh, back in the '70s or '80s. Whenever I grew up. I uh, never really had that offered offered to me. Uh, um, I wish I, I wish I would have. It would have been fun. Yeah, I can totally see you with a mohawk just going <laughs> off. <laughs> well, you would have been my roadie. <laughs> <laughs> I actually had somebody want me to do that once. Uh, a bass player from really? Petersburg, Indiana. We were good friends, and I was only uh, barely eighteen, and I thought better of it. I didn't want to put too much too much trust in 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 that offer. So yeah, yeah, and probably uh, right for the better. Yeah, I think it probably was. <laughs> How long were you here at the middle school in Wapaka again? How many years were you teaching? Twenty five years here. Twenty five years. Okay. So from two, 1994 to two thousand twenty was it nineteen nineteen? Yeah. So twenty five years. When you think of your time at the middle school, uh, what memories come up for you? What was most memorable for you? Most, uh, just what was so impactful for you? Uh, Probably you, Joel. (laughs) Your talent. Um, Uh, I don't know if I have any one thing in particular. Probably when I became the the first halftime band director, I I was saying something. And then they were allowing, um, then I became a full first, uh, then I became a full-time band director. And then they, they continued to hire halftime band directors because we had so many numbers, which is, which says something I think about uh, the quality of the students and instruction and stuff like that. Um, and I was able to start a jazz band um, in which was allowed at first. I started the first jazz band here. Um, and I had to prove that and uh, that it was going to last. And, you know, getting out in the community, Joe, was huge. Uh, going to the vet's home to play, getting over to Rotary Club events to play on Wednesday mornings before school, um, you know, making sure that the, the band program was diverse enough to uh, be able to get out in the community and play for different events, parades and stuff like that. Yeah, you guys, well, the middle school march is at the homecoming parade. Homecoming parade, Memorial Day. Uh, yeah. Um, 
you name it, we're there. If the high school band is there, we're pretty much there too. Um, you know, and we even participated in a, uh, we got the solo ensembles, of course. Um, you, I think you participated in that, didn't you, Joe? Yeah, I believe so. Played a nice tuba solo, I guess. Um, I think I was with a couple of trumpets and there might have been a group of us, like brass. Brass choir. Brass instruments, yeah. yeah. You did one with Zach and Dylan. Oh, yeah. Um, so just to be able to um, get out in the community, I think is huge. And I don't know if they really allow that very much these days because of COVID and stuff. But I think uh, being able to get out in the community was a very important part of my career. I think it was maybe homecoming festivities. We played in front of your stores down on Main Street one year. I don't recall what year that was, but uh, yeah, that was what that was the same year as the smoke on the water thing that my dad was talking about. I okay. think that was that was like an event that was happening on Main Street before homecoming. It was on that same week. Could be, yeah, yeah, on yeah. That last block where mm -hmm. Lucky Tree used to be. It's not there anymore. An old Lucky Tree like in the early 2010s okay mm -hmm. no that's that's what i found with wapaka especially is the uh, once you immerse yourself into it the 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 social benefits it was almost like it was unexpected in a way you know it, i don't mean that to sound weird but it, it was one of those things like when you're when you get involved in wapaka i guess you don't fully appreciate until you start realizing what's going on around you, so, you know, socially and how people tend to pool together to help each other and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you say everybody's perfectly friendly too. So. Oh, from, from shop owners to the veterans home staff, you know, when we, we, we take our jazz band and small groups to play there for, for the, uh, for the residents and, and everybody's just friendly. I mean, I, I, I can't I, dis, I, I, I can't agree with you more, Tim. You're absolutely right. Oh, yeah. No, I just, uh, no, I can't have, an, I don't have enough good things to say about this area. No. I really don't. I think everyone should come here on vacation. Me too. <laughs> and shop, shop in the shops. There you go. Yeah. Well, exactly. You know, do and that. Buy, buy, buy the books that are in the shop. Sure. Great. There you go. <laughs> So do any of your any of your uh, children live here in the area? No, uh, they don't. They of course grew up here. Went to the middle school and high school. They, so my son Adam is uh, now went to Columbia College in Chicago, um, and now is a professional photographer at UIC University of Illinois Chicago, and he's a senior photographer there. Um, and actually, right now is on a, a photography gig down in Atlanta, Georgia, I believe, um, and he's doing some work work there for to benefit the school and he's been doing really well and my daughter Kaylee went of course here and she went to UW Eau Claire and got a uh, degree in kinesiology which uh, got her working at uh, like anytime fitness and then she met her current boyfriend and he was a bar manager at a place called the plus in Eau Claire um, and they uh ended up moving out to when after the pandemic hit or during the pandemic, they ended up going to Arlington, Virginia, moved out there and she got a job out there. And now she, we just moved her to the Boulder, Colorado area about a month or two ago. She's doing really well as the new health and wellness coordinator for the city of Boulder. What made her want to go out to Boulder? Do you know? Well, she did her college internships or college, yeah, college uh, internship, I guess, I guess they call it out there and fell in love with it. She wasn't sure if she was going to like it out there, but uh, we actually went out there to visit her while she was doing that internship and uh, um, her boss, boss's boss retired. So her boss moved up and, and said, Hey, Kaylee, you, I'm moving up. Do you want to interview for the, my position? And Kaylee said, well, sure. So she interviewed and got a few more certifications, got recertified in a couple of different things and, and got the job. And my son, Adam is, uh, of course, his, uh, illustrate, his girlfriend is the illustrator. Her name is Shirley Ellis. And uh, she did the illustrations, as I said, in Hunt for the Black Coral. And, uh, she's, she is incredible. She's so good. And, um, kudos to her for all of her, her work. She went to the art Institute of Chicago and so forth, I believe. 
um, maybe some, a couple other colleges to, um, and she's still she's still working in the area as a uh, artist and so forth. And and she she is just incredible. So I imagine they'll get hitched someday. I don't know for sure, but I think they will. You think you think they'll move back to the area eventually? Uh, I doubt it. There's not a whole lot of gigs here for photographers. I mean, mm -hmm. I think they could, they'll probably stay in a bigger city. Um, I know she, or if they stay together, Shirley wants to go out to say to California where she lived for a while, but I don't blame them. Um, I think there's probably probably more bigger opportunities in those areas um, for their work line of work. So we'll see. I'm curious about something, uh, Greg, and yeah. that is, uh, you did retire from becoming a music teacher, but then you decided to become an author. What made you want to start writing books? Uh, and was this something that you've been wanting to do for a long time and you just uh, couldn't do it because you were teaching? Yeah, basically that was it. Um, when I was in college over at Lawrence University, they, they was, uh, the English staff was just crazy good. And uh, um, they taught me a lot about um, writing skills over there. And I wrote this band instrument quick fix your prayer solutions manual. And uh, it's the first one out there, I think, like it. Um, it's published by GIA out of Chicago. And so that kind of got me in, into it. Um, and then um, it was, when, when was the Strat Lake Mystery? 19, uh, 2000, when did I publish this one? Um, this was 2019, I believe. Yeah. Um, and, uh, so I was out lake raking, actually trying to clean up our our lakefront, keep the stones and sharp objects off the off the off the sand and stuff. We were waiting out, and then I, I looked up the hill and I thought, wait, wait, our cottage is kind of old, right? Um, 2000, uh, 1928 um, cottage, 1928 cottage. Hey, wait a minute, what was going on in 1928? I started thinking, oh, and and um, I think, hey, gangsters, Al Capone, so forth. And the uh, gangsters were, were said to have had some influence in this area too. Uh, Dillinger, mm -hmm. Capone, and stuff like that uh, back in the day. And I started writing. I put down my lake rake and I started writing about uh, finding a gun of Capone's and, and maybe an escape road out of our cottage. And I, I kind of made up the part where Capone used our, our cottage as a hideout and kidnapped these two teenage girls. To use them, to use them as roadside insurance, <laughs> um, and um, so that guy kind of got me interested in in the whole writing thing, and then that then I did not finish that one exactly, so I could uh, write a sequel or uh, a third book as well, the Hunt for the Black Coral, and then the Death Wish of Machu Picchu book. Well, I don't know if I I don't know if many people know this, but weren't there actually gangsters that came up to Wapaka in the 19 early 1900s and uh they came up north from Chicago maybe during the summer yeah as a matter of fact I, I run into people every once in a while saying oh my gosh I, I love your book because my grandfather was a beer runner for Capone up in Three Lakes um and or my you know my my great grandfather was a, you know, something, something for Dillinger. And yeah, so there is some influence here. Wasn't there like the old Wapaka Hotel? There used to be a hotel on the Chain of Lakes. Wasn't, was there a shootout there? Um, am I I'm not sure right? about that, but I know mm. in, in why we are Fremont, there's a old hotel downtown that they say Capone stayed at while he was, um, while he was on his way up to uh, like Three Lakes area, Hayward, where he's supposed to have his real hideout. And we used to have an old hotel called the Grand Hotel. And it's like, you know, I, I'm, I don't want to misspeak because I'm not 100% sure about this, but I think that's, you know, what Grand Avenue was named after or something of that nature. Is that at the, the Vets know? Home, that area? No, it's actually fairly close to where I am right now. It's It's here in the... Uh, it was right on a, one of the lakes, I believe. Oh. Um, yeah, I'll have to look it up because I don't want to misspeak about it, but I know it was there. And I think 
my impression was maybe it burned down and they just never rebuilt it. Could be. Um, yeah, I don't know a huge amount about it. Um, I could check with the historical society. They'd know quite a bit more, obviously. Yeah, but, interesting. Um, I don't know. If, I don't know if any actual gangsters ever were there or not. Um, depending on who you talk to, you know, some people say, yeah, there were, some people don't know or say, no, there weren't, but, um, yeah, it's kind of, I guess it's kind of fun to think about. <laughs> that, oh, really? You know, you my, my father-in-law came up from Chicago after the first or second world war. And, uh, he, I never really talked to him much about the whole scene. Uh, maybe he passed away before I really got into my books. I don't recall now, but, um, or he was at the vet's home and, and uh, he was 98 years old. So he had lived a full life and, and he wanted to be, actually my father, father-in-law Wally wanted to be a farmer. He came up from Chicago, he quit the steel mills, which was a good job back then. And so he survived the depression and so forth. And, and uh, he wanted to be a farmer and he bought uh, some land uh, near Stratton Lake with his first wife and 100 acres. And he was all excited about what he could grow. And the soil agency at the time said, no, you can't grow anything here. It's too sandy. Well, now what am I supposed to do? And the guy said, well, you can subdivide it. So he subdivided said, subdivided several subdivisions um, and uh, sold everything on land contracts with the low down payments people could afford and went into taxes and did real estate for the rest of his career. Then he met his first, then he met his second wife, Loretta, which she was just oh. a wonderful woman. Then he met his first, then he met his second wife, Loretta, which she was just oh. a wonderful woman. Do you yeah. have any uh, ideal places that you like to write, or is there anything that gives you inspiration? That's a good question, guys. Um, uh, besides your dad, Tim, inspiring me. <laughs> yeah, um, but besides, besides him, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, I, I like to be inspired by places I've been, play, things I know about, um, you know, like Mrs. Biba had on my second book, The Hunt for the Black Coral, when, when she was in college, I found out that she was a certified scuba diver and she would take dive trips down to the Florida Keys. And, and that's how she did that for fun and recreation. And then, uh, um, I became certified along with my kids certified scuba divers and I would think oh well maybe maybe we could write about Florida Keys and 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 finding treasure and then we thought about oh the Bermuda Triangle would be cool so I did some research on the Bermuda Triangle and and things that have gone missing in the Bermuda Triangle and treasure and and things like that so so you write about things you know and like when I think I mentioned earlier my kids were rotary students in South America uh, Paraguay and, and uh, Chile. And so I uh, kind of use that influence and inspiration. Talk about being inspired. Uh, my kids were great Rotary students when they were juniors in high school. Uh, I know you're, didn't you have a student that came here from Rotary that uh, stayed at your place? And I believe you went to their wedding. Right. Yep, yep that, that's good memory. Uh, there, his name is Batu. He was, lived in Turkey. Batu lived in Turkey. He was a Rotary student. And this is two years ago now, I think, roughly. Actually, went over there, I think, three years ago for a vacation. Then I believe two summers ago, he got married. And we went there for uh, his, a vacation and to be a part of his wedding. As a matter of fact, we have another wedding we're going to go to. Lee, uh, Mia, Mia is getting married. She was from a uh, Rotary, Rotary Exchange student from Finland. And then uh, we're going to go to Finland next year to her wedding in next August. We also had Lisa from Belgium. We had Jimmy from South Africa. Anyway, we've had a lot of, a lot of exchange students. It's just been wonderful for, for Rotary. I, that's another thing I'm doing now. I've joined the Rotary Club. Now, I remember, I don't know if I ever took you over to the Rotary events to have you play uh, before schools, but um, we, oh. um, uh, I love being a Rotarian now and every Wednesday morning we meet and, uh, um, uh, we, uh, talk about the latest things going on in Wapaka and how we can help the community. I'm not super familiar with the Rotary Club other than the Rotary Exchange. Mm -hmm. What, what else does the Rotary Club do that isn't the student exchange program? 
Oh, we fundraise a lot for different events. Uh, we have Casino Royale. We have uh, all sorts of different fundraising events that happen throughout the throughout the community throughout the year throughout the year. Yeah. What's Casino Royale? Um, usually at the Par Four Restaurant or the Old Foxfire uh, fu fundraising event where uh, people from the community can come out and do a little little Las Vegas gambling on a low low key scale. And then the funds funds uh, made can go towards needed items in Mopaca. Do you ever get in on the uh, gambling? Play no, with I, I haven't really. Or blackjack? Uh, I'd probably be good at it, but no, I never really did. Not yet. Uh, I went once or twice before before joining Rotary, but uh, got to make sure you clear the, clear the calendar for that night. <laughs> uh, are you a Packer fan, Greg? Oh my gosh, yes, uh, all the way, all the way, man, all the way, ever since I can remember, I remember my dad screaming at the TV back in the day when the Packers were going to their first Super Bowl and and how they kind of didn't do so well after a few years and then back in what was the early 1990s or so when they got back in the Super Bowl runs, yeah, mm -hmm. big time, big time. Now my, I think I mentioned my wife's aunt, uh, Gene Wilson, uh, years ago, was uh, a member, a uh, runner-up to the Packer Hall of Fame, Packer Fan Hall of Fame, I should say. And so she continues to wear her Green Bay Packer clothes every day. Um, so she's just a big Packer fan as well. You mentioned that your uh, dad was watching one of the first Super Bowls. Did you yeah. get to watch uh, Super Bowl one and two on TV. Oh, was, no, I was too young. I think I was only two or three years old. I think when was it 67 or 60? Kind of remember. Help me out, Tim. When was the first Super Bowl? 67, 69? It's terrible. I don't know. Well, it's been think, like 55 years ago. Yeah, I was a little, I yeah. was too young to enjoy. Well, how, enjoy. how old are you, Greg? I'm 57, going to be 58. Okay. So we're, we're pretty much the same age. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. I wouldn't have. I don't have any recollection of the first three or four Super Bowls either. One funny story, um, Dawn's Aunt Jean was at a Packer game when, um, I'm trying to remember who the field goal kicker was, but anyway, they, did, they had multiple roles back then where they could kick field goals or they could be a running back or wide receiver. I'm trying to remember who the, the guy was now that kicked the field goal, but Aunt Jean was a big drinker at the time, so she had two cups of beer one in each hand. Okay, and that's before the days of the nets behind the field goal uh, stands, yep, right. And um, all of a sudden, the uh, Jean is walking with her beers, and the crowd screaming for the, um, you know, the someone going to get that ball, and it dropped right by her feet. This is her story. And rather than dropping the beers to get the the ball, which would be worth a fortune right now. Um, she kept the beers and she sat on the ball <laughs> and then somebody ended up taking the ball right out of her butt. That's rude. Yeah, very much. Um, and she, um, was proud to keep those beers all. <laughs> Should have thrown the beer at that guy who took the oh, ball yeah, and took the sure. ball back. Exactly. <laughs> Do you go to Lambo much for games? Um, as a matter of fact, um, a couple of years ago, I did that uh, for the well, pack of VFW. I volunteered on the uh, the uh, booth committee, the uh, concession booth committee. I was volunteer for a couple of years, um, and uh, I helped them uh, uh, every, every, actually, pretty much every home game for a couple of years. Um, just volunteered and do the concession booths. Uh, now I don't get there much, maybe once a year or so. Any memorable moments, any memorable games that you were at? I'm not really. Um, oh, let's see. Um, I know Mrs. Biba had one. Um, uh, I wasn't there evidently that year for some reason, but uh, maybe I had a gig or something. But she, she had said that uh, there was a, this is the days before COVID, of course, where you could get away with accepting uh, food items from people uh, without no, without, with no problems. Um, there was a touchdown Bob, I think his name was, and uh, he would give out touchdown cheese 
cheese little cheese curds, touchdown sausage for field goals and touchdowns whenever um, the Packers would score a touchdown or get a field goal. Some people didn't like it, but, you know, <laughs> what? Is football the only sport that you watch, or are you a basketball fan as well? Any oh, very sport? much. Yeah, huge, huge. Uh, I was actually a wrestling coach here for a while, for a while in Wapaka, too, when I first started here. Um, not all star wrestling or anything like that, you know, the, <laughs> I was a wrestling coach here. Um, and uh, uh, I love basketball, love baseball, love the Brewers, love the Bucks. Uh, yeah, huge, huge sports fan. Try to get to at least one game a year at, at those venues. I'm a big, I'm a big football fan. Not necessarily, you know, I want to see the Packers win and all that, but it's more like, I just like the game of football. Yeah. It's, it's more like the handful of teams I don't like and I always root against. <laughs> but, uh, you know, there, there's some of them are just, you know, let's face it, some of those teams are just massively dysfunctional. Yeah. I, you don't even, I don't even have to list them off. I think most people that are football fans know exactly what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, I know. I'll, I won't even mention them either. I might offend somebody too. Yeah. yeah. But no, to me, I just like, maybe that's what ties into the fantasy football stuff because I've been into that for many years. Yeah. So. Yeah, I happened to win that trophy that's behind you. I uh, won last year. You did, Joe. Yeah. Wow. Impressive. I think your name's on it two or three times now. Wow. Yep. I have it on three times and you've won as well mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's yeah. for a wapaka league that we've been doing for almost 10 years now yeah yeah, was, yeah, yeah. I, I started it a long time ago when joe was pretty little as a thing that him and his friends could do every year together mm -hmm. you know they get the little plaque made and put on there it's got enough space for another probably 30 years yeah plaque. And pretty much the same, the same uh, uh, group of guys, or not group, it's not all guys, there's some girls too. Same group of people have been uh, in the league for quite a while. Mm -hmm. so, although uh, we, me and uh, Pastor Andy from Trinity got kicked out for a while. What is that? What did you do? We didn't do no. anything. It's just, you know, I think, I think the general consensus was they wanted to keep it in a more generalized, a more, uh, around joe's age group oh but now that they've gotten older and gotten more competitive they let us back in well that's so, good <laughs> yeah uh, because we're both both i and uh, pastor andy are very very competitive when it comes to that so, oh yeah yeah i can't see so, pastor andy being that competitive but yeah i guess i don't know him that well no he's pretty competitive when it comes to uh sports he's a he's a pretty big sports fan so. yeah uh, unfortunately, I think it, uh, his love may lie more with the Vikings, but Ooh. yeah, yeah, but, yeah, not a good choice. <laughs> um, I, it's one of those teams. I don't dislike them, but I kind of have a problem with them playing in a dome. I always thought football was meant to be played outside. So I grew up in Indiana. So warming up to the Colts was hard because we were in a big dome, but, uh, huh. Although I did like Peyton. Peyton was cool. Yeah. Do you think the Vikings have now become maybe as equal or even larger rivals to the Packers than the Bears have? Ooh, that's a good question, Joe. I don't think no. I don't think the, the Bears are still number one, but uh, of course the Vikings, you know, it's like like the Bre the Brewers in the box, you know, if the Vikings have a worst record or if the Brewers or Bucks play a team that has a worst record I'm always skeptical that we're going to win I don't know what it is but it seems like we always have a letdown mm. I don't know if you guys see that at all when you when you watch those games uh, I don't really the last few years I suppose in this upcoming year I, I I don't really I don't have the bear the bears haven't even touched us have they I don't remember the whole thing about Aaron Rodgers owns them and all that. Oh, that yeah, I heard that. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, of course uh, you know, you, you know, they don't really have or they haven't had any way, you know, any real key players at like you know positions like quarterback. Well, that's true. You know, that's true. You know I, uh, Trubinsky, you know, uh, 
you know, he may turn out to be a stellar quarterback, but he just wasn't the answer for Chicago. Well, same thing with our, our Jordan Love, too, our second stringer right now. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's a whole other thing. I don't want to get into that. I'm still not sure why you, know, you trade up to pick him, but it seems mm -hmm. to be a, a, seems to be a bit of confusion on that topic. <laughs> so, yeah. Well, especially for, such dire need of a receiver, any receiver. At the time. Yeah. Before I forget, Joe, um, I wanted to mention one thing to you that I'd forgotten. I'm sorry um, about uh, my books. Okay. Um, and uh, I could not have done this without Cam and Potts' help. Cam and Potts is a local Wapaka gal. Actually, had her son in band years and years ago, um, and uh, she she's uh, my book agent uh, and editor, and she has her own uh, Facebook and web I believe Facebook web page called Cam and De Cam and by Design or Fine Print. Cam and uh, another Fine Print by Cam and Potts. So I just want to give her a shout out here. Um, and uh, fine print by Cam and Potts. So she, I, she's just incredibly talented um, and knowledgeable about the whole writing process too. I like how you're, uh, how uh, humble you are. You're not like, oh, look at me, look at my books. You know, you give props where props are due. So oh, you have to. You know, I appreciate well, he just that. Does, he just does that when he's in front of a mirror, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> you know me pretty well tim no it's kidding flexes does all kinds of stuff oh, you, know geez. <laughs> <laughs> you know pretty well no it's really appreciate your your in time it was just great i had enjoyed it and love, love to do it again sometime maybe when i get done with the third book the death wish and machu picchu book oh yeah yeah, I'd love to talk to you. Uh, yeah. yeah i mean one more time too uh to the to four people that watch this podcast um <laughs> you can get greg's book at at a lot of different gift shops and, it, you know, and really if you just ask somebody in one of the stores where they can find one they'll tell you but uh, also on amazon so right. if you got interest that's where you can find them i appreciate and, that tim thank you yeah yeah and actually well the four well the four people that i know watch this podcast actually uh you know they're related to us and already have the book so you know maybe they'll get the word out so maybe we'll get out to the you know, tens of tens of people or something oh there you go tens of tens at least right do you have a is there a social media page at all for uh your books or do um i bet people if they already know you and follow you on facebook you post about uh, Ooh, i do facebook when the machu picchu book comes right. out yeah i'll do that um yeah, I'll, I'll do a lot of Facebook posts or Greg Biba at, uh, let's see, Greg Biba author. Uh, see if I can read my own writing here on my business card. Um, Greg Biba author at gmail.com. Greg Biba author at gmail.com. Or Facebook is Greg Biba author. So, Make sure to follow that page, everybody. Uh, know about his books coming up. Uh, I know he's been working very hard on the, Machu Picchu book for a couple of years now and right. uh, all his books are just terrific so again thank you so much for coming on thank you Joel thank you Tim very very much I look forward right. to seeing you guys soon all right take care man bye-bye you too